Hey everyone, in this lesson I'm going to talk to you guys about the pentose phosphate pathway, or otherwise known as the pentose phosphate shunt. I'm going to talk to you guys about how this pathway operates, why the pathway is so important to human health. I'm also going to tell you guys about some of the regulation of the pathway, which tissues tend to use this pathway the most, and finally I'm going to talk to you guys about some problems that can occur if this pathway doesn't operate um, correctly. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples or tell you some examples of some human health conditions that can occur if this pathway doesn't operate correctly. So um, to begin, what is the pentose phosphate pathway? Well, the pathway is also known as the hexose monophosphate shunt. Um, it occurs in virtually all cell types and tissues. Um, one of the main utilizers of the pathway is the liver, which utilizes 30% of its glucose um, for uh, the pentose phosphate pathway. Other tissues um, that utilize this uh, pathway quite a bit are the red blood cells um, to maintain oxidative capacity. The liver also utilizes this pathway to, um, uh, to uh, protect itself against uh, oxidative stress due to drug metabolism. Um, and some of the tissues that don't utilize this pathway so much include uh, muscles. Uh, muscles uh, don't utilize this pathway so much. Um, this pathway occurs in the cytoplasm. Um, it produces NADPH. Now, um, NADPH is very necessary for several pathways. One includes um, fatty acid synthesis. 50% um, of NADPH typically goes to uh, fatty acid synthesis. Um, again, as I mentioned before, NADPH um, is necessary for oxidative stress homeostasis. So this is why we see the liver and red blood cells using the pathway. Um, they do so to generate NADPH to protect themselves against oxidative stress. And uh, NADPH is also important for cytochrome P450 enzymes, and this is again important in the liver. Um, this uh, pentose phosphate pathway also produces trioses, hexoses, and pentoses, and uh, pentoses are necessary for nucleotide synthesis. So where does this all begin? Well, the pathway actually begins uh, near the beginning of glycolysis pathway with glucose 6-phosphate. So what happens is instead of um, glucose 6-phosphate going down um, the glycolysis pathway, it gets shunted into another pathway um, by the enzyme glucose phosphate dehydrogenase. So glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase converts glucose 6-phosphate to glucono-1,5-lactone 6-phosphate. And in doing so, it actually takes an NADP plus and reduces it to an NADPH. Now this uh, step of the pentose phosphate pathway is actually the rate limiting step and um, NADPH the product of this step actually inhibits the enzyme low levels of NADPH can actually activate this enzyme as well so once you have glucono 15 lactone 6 phosphate um, this can actually be converted into 6 phosphogluconate which then can be converted into ribulose 5 phosphate and this is done by the enzyme 6 phosphogluconate dehydrogenase um, and again, in this step, NADP plus is uh, actually uh, reduced to NADPH. So this is, again, another important um, step of the pathway. So for this pathway, guys, I want you to remember that um, the, the first and the third step of the pathway are the ones that generate NADPH. And, and um, I want you guys to try to remember these two enzymes. Now, once you have ribulose 5-phosphate, it can do a couple of different things. Um, one, it can actually get converted to xylulose 5-phosphate by ribulose phosphate 3 epimerase. And then the xylulose 5-phosphate can actually be redirected um, back into the glycolysis pathway um, by getting converted into fructose 6-phosphate by transketolase. So once, uh, once the cell kind of generates its NADPH, it can actually redirect its, its end product back into the glycolysis pathway so that uh, the, the cell can actually generate ATP from, from that substrate. So uh, this is, it's, it's incredibly clever how the cell can actually do this. If it needs NADPH, it can just redirect it into the pentose phosphate pathway and then back into the glycolysis pathway to get some ATP from it as well. Um, another way or another thing that the ribulose 5-phosphate can do is it can actually be converted into um, ribose 5-phosphate by ribose phosphate isomerase enzyme. Once you generate ribose 5-phosphate, it can actually be converted into 5-phosphoribosyl 1-pyrophosphate or PRPP. Now this is the this is the molecule I want you guys to remember. This molecule is very, very important. 
um, in medicine, and we always want to know this because this molecule we can direct uh, can be directed into pyrimidine or purine synthesis. So this is the molecule that really determines pyrimidine and purine synthesis um, for cells. So PRPP, remember that guys, 5-phosphorabicil, 1-pyrophosphate. So now that you guys know um, the importance of PRPP um, for pyrimidine and purine synthesis, now um, what can happen is in, in cells that have nucleotides, um, this, the nucleotides can actually be broken down into ribose 5-phosphate. Now ribose 5-phosphate can be converted into um, back into some of these earlier steps. So I, I, it, I, I show these arrows as one directional, but a lot of these are reversible. So what can happen is ribose 5-phosphate can actually be redirected and into the glycolysis pathway um, through ribulose 5-phosphate, xylose 5-phosphate, and into fructose 6-phosphate. So there are some common steps where ribose 5-phosphate generated from nucleotide breakdown can actually be redirected into the glycolysis pathway either for ATP generation or um, for glucose generation. So it's just important to note that as well, guys. Um, so again, before I move on from this, I want to just talk to you guys about a few different routes this um, this glucose 6-phosphate can take. So one that we mentioned was glucose 6-phosphate can actually be directed um, down to ribulose 5-phosphate. You can generate a couple of NADPH and it can be redirected back into the glycolysis pathway. So that's one way it can actually um, proceed. Now another way it can proceed is that glucose 6-phosphate can go down to ribulose 5-phosphate again, go um, be converted into ribulose 5-phosphate and then into PRPP for nucleotide synthesis. So that's another way it can be um, redirected. So there's a few different methods for which um, this pathway can proceed. So I just want you guys to know that um, the pathway can proceed in multiple directions depending on what the cell needs. If the cell needs, um, if the cell needs ATP, um, it can go back into the glycolysis pathway if it if it if it's going to create nucleotides um, for nucleotide synthesis, it'll go it'll get directed into PRPP synthesis. So um, that's all I want you guys to know for now. But um, the main thing again is that this pathway generates NADPH. It generates two of them, and it also generates substrates for nucleotide synthesis. So that's all I want you guys to know for now. So now. Now that the pentose phosphate pathway actually generates NADPH, what is it actually needed for? Why is NADPH so important? Well, um, as I mentioned before, the uh, NADPH is necessary or um, important for oxidative stress homeostasis. Now, things um, such as oxidant stress from drugs, from, from metabolism, can create um, hydrogen peroxide and can create superoxides. It can create it can create uh, uh, free radicals. It can create um, oxidative stress. So how does the cell actually deal with this? Well, the cell deals with it by um, by way of NADPH. Now, NADPH, um, once it's generated from the pentose phosphate pathway, can actually be utilized by an enzyme known as, uh, known as glutathione reductase. So glutathione reductase actually... Uh, oxidizes the NADPH to NADP+, and in the meantime it'll actually reduce uh, oxidized glutathione into reduced glutathione. Now once the cell has reduced glutathione, it can take the glutathione um, and utilize it um, via the enzyme glutathione peroxidase, um, and in doing so it can actually reduce and actually process the hydrogen peroxide into two H2O, so it can actually process something that's something that's um, potentially dangerous and toxic to the cell into something that's not. So it can it can convert hydrogen peroxide into two water molecules. So this is um, the way a cell typically can actually reduce a lot of its oxidative stress by this mechanism. So this mechanism is very important, particularly in erythrocytes or red blood cells. So I just want you to remember that, guys. This pathway is critical for erythrocytes. So um, now moving on to some of the problems that, what that can happen um, if this enzyme or this pathway is malfunctional. And now one of the major malfunctions of this pathway is actually in its first step, in its first enzyme. So um, a deficiency of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase can actually occur. Um, so remember, as I mentioned before, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is the first 
rate limiting step of the pentose phosphate pathway. And in fact, this deficiency um, is so prevalent that it's one of the most prevalent um, um, genetic disorders in the world. 7.5% uh, of the world population is actually deficient in this enzyme. Um, some areas of Africa are up to 35% prevalent, um, or up to 35% um, of, the, of the population in certain parts of Africa are actually deficient in this enzyme. And there are some theories about why this is. It could be that it um, being deficient in this enzyme could be protective against malaria. And this deficiency is an X-linked recessive inheritance. So typically males are the most affected by this, uh, this deficiency. So being deficient in this enzyme may cause a few different, um, few different uh, syndromes or symptoms. One of them is hemolytic anemia. So as I mentioned before, erythrocytes depend critically on um, the pentose pathway for um, NADPH generation and uh, oxidative stress capacity. And um, hemolytic anemia can occur um, after several different things. It can occur after ingestion of anti-malaria medications. It can occur um, um, after eating, even after eating some fava beans. Called it's that the condition is called favism. Um, it's just any type of um, abnormal stress that can occur on the cell can actually cause a hemolytic anemia because the cells are a little more sensitive because they are deficient in this enzyme. And this may also cause um, neonatal hyperbilirubinemia or neonatal jaundice. Now, um, there's a physiological jaundice in, um, in a neonatal period um, that which is normal. Um, there is a neonatal jaundice which is normal. It's called physiologic jaundice and that occurs between two to three days of, of birth or two to three days of age. Now if the baby is becoming um, jaundiced within the first 24 hours of birth then you may want to check to see if this uh, enzyme is deficient or not. So um, that is some of the main causes um, could be due to um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Anyways guys, that was a quick video on the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.